the law has broadly defined a lot of these terms. So they are trying to curb in issues like deceptive marketing practices, and the statute specifically uses that term, but it has not defined the term yet. But if you look at the legislative history, which is kind of the reason why the statute was created, they're looking at to avoid things where patients are not informed about the costs of their treatment, that they're not informed that they're responsible for their deductible and stat um, out-of-pocket costs, that they're not informed that they have to pay rents. Um, so the statute is designed to say, you as treatment providers need to avoid these deceptive practices. So kind of going off of what Dr. Rodriguez was saying is that when a patient comes in, there are a few things that you as a treatment provider do need to do. Number one, make clear representations about who you are. So if for some reason you utilize a call center or a third-party marketer, if they're going through there and they're not being informed where the patient's going to end up finally, you want to make sure that you work with your company to say that if a patient calls asking for ABC treatment facility, they get at ABC treatment facility, and they're not sent to Arizona or New Mexico or wherever it is. That's the number one issue. The second issue is cost. You, under DCF statute and also under Florida law, are required to advise patients of your cost. So if you charge $1,000 a day for detox, you have to tell the patient, we will bill you $1,000 a day. If we choose to bill your insurance, you're also responsible under Florida law for the cost of your patient responsibility. And um, that's a separate statute that already exists. And if a lot of you have gone through audits, you probably got tagged on that. Now, there's a difference between informing someone of cost and collecting on cost. And I say that with the knowledge that people in treatment, the first day they're there, they're, you're lucky if you can get them to sign paperwork. So having them write you over a $50,000 check is usually not gonna be the case to cover their deductible. So it's important for you to have a good relationship and be clear with any of their representatives. It's important for you as the patient progresses through treatment to remind them. I've advised a lot of my clients to have a process upon discharge. We, if you remember, I told you you had a $10,000 deductible. I'm required by law to send you your bill. You will be receiving it in the mail. I can work with you. You can make payment plans if you can pay parts of like $10 a month, whatever it is. But you must show that you're making a reasonable effort to collect. And then, Doug, to your last question with in regards to what I'm going to call ancillary services. These are costs that are not included in the medical and clinical services you may provide in the treatment center. Ancillary services, number one, are separate and apart from your per diem. So if you provide detox, it's separate from your medical office visits, your assessments, and your clinical team. So for example, if you wanted to provide travel, this is a separate cost. And travel is something you have to be very careful of because you may fall within patient brokering. And what that means is I'm giving the patient a free airline ticket to fly to Florida to come to my treatment center. That is specifically prohibited. Now, if you assist the patient and say, well, I can pay part of it and you pay the other half and you're going to have to owe me the money and I'm going to bill you for it, there is a valid exchange and that would not be considered as much of a patient brokering issue. I have to tell you as a lawyer, because we're always indifferent, that this, this has not been seen as an issue. If you have a valid promissory note, if you're going after the money, if you're getting a credit card, it has not been seen as an issue to assist a patient with travel, but flat out paying for it is definitely patient brokering. And I, what I can't tell you is that if the state's going to take a different position once the law and the rules are regulated and they've fully developed. So this is something you want to get involved with because it's my opinion that the first thing that we should do is try to get somebody into treatment and then worry about how are they going to pay for it. And just following up on that, Anelia, if I'm a treatment provider in Arizona and I'm sending a client to Florida and I in Arizona pay for that flight... Now, as an Arizona provider, I am not subject to Florida law. Is that correct? Well, the answer is yes and no. Okay. okay. So, a typical lawyer answer, yes and no. <laughs> um, if you are exchanging or doing business in the state of Florida, you can technically be subject to Florida law. And the new statute actually specifically states that a person is subject to that statute if you are exchanging business in Florida or working with patients in Florida. So for example, if you are a treatment facility in Florida, you're obviously subject to the statute and the marketing prohibish, uh, prohibitions. But if also you're located in Arizona and you are marketing to Florida patients, which means your website, your call center, any of that, you take inbound calls, you may also be subject to the Florida law. 
So my recommendation is, is to be very careful and vet out your practices. Um, patient brokering is a federal as well as a state issue. Florida tends to be more restrictive than some of the other states, like Tennessee and, and the, you know, some of the smaller state populations, but Florida is also actively going out to every state and saying, hey, California, this is what we're doing in Florida, and, and hey, New York and New Jersey. <coughs> so um, California's actually just passed a similar bill to the Florida statute now. Mm -hmm. So it, the law is changing, and it's good to have someone to have on your side. 